We didn't talk so much about the treatment modalities or options for various mental illnesses. And I'm curious how you think of psychoanal psychoanalysis as practiced by contemporary analysis and how you think it stacks up as a modality for treating various mental illnesses like the ones we mentioned earlier like depression on the one hand or schizophrenia or these personality yeah. disorders or bipolar yeah um so i don't want to I don't want to rag on anybody who practices psychoanalysis or participates in psychoanalysis mm -hmm. as a way of self-discovery. You know, I think that, that there are benefits to talking to a supportive, smart person, going over your past, even if the sort of meta theory that Freud offers is, is, is in the end not that powerful, because it'll be hugely beneficial. And the thing is, almost all psychoanalysts don't just do psychoanalysis. Often they're sort of very smart, sensitive, perceptive patient people who will work with somebody to sort of explore what's going on in their heads. And if you have the time, if you could afford it, it could actually be pretty beneficial. But if you have bipolar depression, there are certain medications you should take that will do a lot for you. Um, if you are, um, if you are, have suffered from a phobia or you're obsessive or an obsessive compulsive, you can't stop washing your hands. Cognitive behavioral therapy is the treatment of choice. Mm -hmm. And and for a whole lot of things, we, there are actually better therapies than psycho. Putting aside whatever psychoanalysis, there are better therapies. Typically, some combination of medication with talking. With talking. But the talking may just be, you know, let's, let's go over some procedures to make your phobia go away. And here's what we do. And, you know, it's funny because you, you see... Um, I, I, I just finished teaching intro, intro psych, so I show a clip of, um, of um, Freudian psychoanalysis. I show a clip from Sopranos. And Tony, Tony Sopranos talking about his dream, and Dr. Malfi's doing this interview. It's so moving. And then I show a, a clip of modern cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's in this sterile white room with fluorescent light, and they're sitting at a table together. And the psychologist is saying, so here's what we're going to do, here's our, and here's why we think it works. And it's so unsexy. It's so honest. And here's a procedure we're going to use. And this is why we think any questions and so on. And um, nonetheless, cognitive behavioral therapy is unsexy. It is a friend of mine who is a clinical psychologist says it just bores the crap out of her. It's so boring to do. Mm. The only thing is it does make people better. Yeah. And so. And when you advocate CBT for something like phobias, I'm guessing that this recommendation comes from a review of the literature, which then That's right. comes out very favorably. And I'm wondering what sort of studies there are on psychoanalysis in this same vein that you're drawing on when you do not make this recommendation and you think that there are better treatments. Yeah, it, it's there's often sort of comparison treatments where they pit different treatments against one another. And it is harder to assess psychoanalysis, particularly traditional psychoanalysis, because like they might say that for, for the truly traditional stuff, you're going to come four times a week, lie in a sofa, and it's going to be a few years. And in some way, when somebody says that, they've immediately disqualified themselves. You don't want to spend three years because you're afraid you can't go to work because you're afraid that there's spiders in a parking lot. Right. Um, there, there are, it is, it is, and psychoanalysts and psychodynamic theorists in general will stress this. It's kind of hard to fairly test their treatment in part. And to be fair, and this is something maybe, maybe could have a, a compromise position. They don't, they, they will tell you we're not really in the business of curing phobias are curing bipolar depression. We're in the business of, you know, turning mental illness into everyday misery. We're in the difference in, in the business of of helping people learn about themselves and learn how to get tied up in knots and learn how to think better and have a better picture of themselves. So they don't have the sort of sharp treatment goals that insurance companies love and scientists like to test for. You know? I could tell when your phobia goes away, you say, I'm not afraid of spiders anymore. 
I can't really tell whether you have insight into your your mental processes. Are you living sort of the best life you can? Hmm. Well, this point about the duration of treatment is very well taken, but I can still imagine that, I mean, just playing, I guess, devil's yeah. advocate for the psychoanalyst, that there might be some sort of promise that psychoanalysis might have some sort of promise for quote unquote rewiring the brain and then and that money aside there might be some utility in a uh, conjunctive treatment of a medication on the one hand yeah. and then psychoanalysis on the other so that over time perhaps you don't need to take that medication anymore but then of course you still run into those same problems with um trusting with um testing i mean and especially there are yeah. huge mm -hmm. uh, monetary hurdles to running a, a sizable test etc yeah i mean also just to be fair a lot of people who do psychoanalysis tend to be psychiatrists mm -hmm. um and psychiatrists are actually um able to prescribe medication and so sometimes psychoanalysis isn't necessarily incompatible with medication you may go to go to a a, a shrink who who gives you, you know, Prozac or some modern variant of it. And also, you know, spends a lot of time talking to you about your mother. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe one response is um, the way you're framing it. So totally, I'll respond. You can respond, respond back. But, but there is a sort of a burden of proof thing, which is you asked me reasonably enough, where are the studies that showed a psychoanalysis doesn't, after the long procedure and everything, doesn't yield positive? Results and those, I think those are those are difficult to, to find because of the amorphousness of what a success counts for. But shouldn't it be more? Um, we should look towards them and say, "Where's your evidence that you work?" Because if not, you're wasting a lot of people's time and money, and worse than that, you're you're taking them away from therapies that do seem to have notable proof. Sure, sure, and. I have done zero research on this whatsoever, but so you can tell me if I'm wrong. If the preponderance of analyzans who come out from a full term analysis report that they feel much better, because at least in the public culture uh, where I have heard these sorts of anecdotal responses, they've all been pretty positive uh, that people have had good experiences if they've completed the analysis. But this might uh, be statistically problematic because you're discounting all the people who don't complete the analysis because it didn't work. Yeah, all of those. Well, first thing, anybody who says analyzans is not unfamiliar to literature. <laughs> um, but but you're you're right, which is that that you know have all sorts of anecdotes about you know, everybody, everybody who lost weight on a on a sort of a, a high fat Atkins like diet will tell you about it. Everyone whose meditation has led them to right. inner peace will stop you and say, "Dude, let me tell you about my meditation practice." The people who who it doesn't work out for are less vocal about it, and even for the people for whom it works, it's sort of psych one hundred and one. But there's issues of like placebo effects and so on. Right. So even if after four years, suppose you test everybody after four years of extensive psychotherapy, and they all say, I'm better off because of it. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe most people after, give them a four-year gap, they're feeling better. Or maybe, you know, the very idea that they've spent all this money and did all this treatment, if, if they played, you know, they said, we're going to have you play video games in the office. Four years later, I'll say, oh, I'm much better now. Mm -hmm. I hope you don't feel like I'm trying to be on the, the psychoanalyst bully pulpit fighting you back. I, I, no, I like, I, I like this because, because I'm the pro Freud guy mm -hmm. in, in my, in my, book. I included a chapter in my book. I say nice things about him. So, so mm -hmm. getting, this is, this is, this clip will, I hope go viral and, and help my cred with by my colleagues. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, well, one last question here. So the unconscious, even if it's not attributed to Freud, has been retained as a vital part of contemporary yeah. psychology. A lot of talk therapy is referred to as psychotherapy or psychodynamic yeah. therapy. And I'm wondering, is this etymological connection just purely accidental? Or 
is Freudian theory still deeply ingrained in our more mainstream contemporary therapeutic modalities than people in a psychology department would like to admit? So it, it's, a, it's a good question. And I think, I, I think a, a clinical psychologist would be able to give you a better answer. Mm-hmm. But, but my sense of it is there's Freudian therapy, which is a fairly narrow sort of things based on certain Freudian ideas. And there's a broader category of talk therapy. So if you're depressed or you're anxious, you're having problems with your relationships, you see somebody, most likely they're going to talk to you. You know, nobody, nobody would ever give you medication and say, get out of here, you got your medication. You know, one of them talk to you. And, and it's a separate question. So there's all these sort of treatments for depression, the, the cognitive side of CBT, the cognitive side of cognitive behavioral therapy, which involve, you know, listening sensitively to you and, um, and, and uh, uh, asking you questions, getting you to think about your life in, in a more reasonable way, maybe trying to combat some of your, some of the sort of um, negative thinking that people with depression are prone to, you know, so a standard dialogue, and this isn't Freudian at all, but this talk therapy is you come in and say, and say, you know, I, uh, I, I fail this exam. My life is all, I'm, I'm a failure. And then this, the psychologist goes, well, so what's the worst thing that could happen if you fail your exam? Well, oh, you know, no, no, kick me out of school. And what's the worst thing that could happen for that? And through directed questioning, you kind of get the person to think more realistically about things. Um, you know, there's a view, there, there's, there's sort of, again, we're getting, again, with the sort of falsifiability contradictions. For certain problems like phobias and so on, there are, are treatments that work. But there's also what psychologists call a dodo bird effect, which is often... Therapy in general works regardless of what school is motivated from. Part of this is because therapies, therapists in the real world tend to be eclectic. It's very unusual to get someone who's a pure Freudian or pure humanist or pure CBT. They tend to be eclectic. But also because all therapy, all talk therapy, shares certain ingredients. And ingredients like, um, like the idea of, of sympathy. Of here's somebody listening to you. So here's somebody who cares about you. Mm-hmm. So who, who has ho- all see, you see a therapist and all of a sudden there's hope. You're doing something. The therapist thinks you're going to get better. And maybe these general things play a role, very separate from any specific Freudian or any other claims. Right. And what you're pointing to, I think, is how tangled the theoretical, the the therapeutic uh, interaction is with all sorts of things. Um with the the relationships you develop, just having somebody to talk to, perhaps the yeah. medication you're taking. I mean, there are so many variables that it's going to be very hard to isolate one of them, control for one in studies. It is, but 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 you can do. You know, it's, these are expensive and difficult studies. And putting aside psychoanalysis, to taking many years. There's actually short term psychoanalysis, which which can be tested. Really, but but putting aside putting aside that you can actually, you know, have three groups. One group is a wait list thing where you apply for treatment, you don't get any treatment. The second group just gets talk therapy. The third group gets talk therapy therapy plus a certain medication. Maybe the fourth group gets talk therapy and a different medication. And then you compare and contrast. You see who's better at that. And, you know, this work is difficult to do. It's expensive. Um, the effects are going to be muted by the, by the fact that some therapists are better than others, regardless of what they're doing. The effects are going to be muted by your point before, which is two people who come in and both get diagnosed as, depre- as have suffering from major depression, but they have different things wrong with them at some interesting level. But nonetheless, just for the same logic, you could compare different medications for, you know, for COVID or something. You, could, you can do this for, for, for depression or schizophrenia. 